All right, if you've got your Bibles, please turn to Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, Luke chapter 10. I'll be reading from that in just a few minutes. I didn't mention earlier that Pastor Wes is not here this weekend, clearly, but he's not traveling uh, or for vacation, I should say. He's actually out of town at a wedding. He is uh, administering a wedding to somebody who is actually a member of this church. So he'll be back next weekend to continue what will promise to be a very busy end of the summer and then uh, into the fall. Uh, so um, he'll be back then. So again, hey, if you're able, in the meantime, you've got to deal with me, so please stand as we uh, honor the reading of God's Word. Again, I'm in Luke's Gospel, chapter 10. I'm going to start in verse 25. These will be some familiar verses to many of us. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What's written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you've answered correctly, do this, and you'll live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite. When he came to the place and saw him, pass by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him, bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, then set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him. Whatever more you spend, I'll repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers. He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Please pray with me and for me as we work through this familiar section of Scripture. Lord, thank you for bringing us your word so readily available to us. Forgive us, Lord, when uh, passages like this come along. We've heard them so many times. It becomes euphemistic uh, in society, both in and outside of churches. But let us pause, slow down a little bit, and get a greater understanding of what it is, Jesus, that you were teaching then and teaching us now. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please have a seat. In 1960, the United States had elected a new president, John F. Kennedy. And John F. Kennedy stood up shortly after he was elected in front of the entire country and made a bold pledge that America would put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. It was bold, it was ambitious, some thought it was preposterous, but the reality was that America was locked in two battles with the Soviet Union, modern-day Russia. The first was a Cold War, which was getting colder by the day, and the second was a space race, which many argued America was losing. America hadn't even put a man into space and brought him back down safely. Russia had already done that. So it was bold, it was ambitious for Kennedy to say what he said, but people got on board, and some of the best and the brightest around the country, engineers and scientists, gathered together and began the Apollo space program. Several years later, sadly after Kennedy had been killed, his dream was realized. Apollo 11 was launched from Cape Canaveral, and America and the world watched, glued to their television sets, as Apollo 11 made a three-day journey to the moon, landed on it, two men walked on it. We've all seen the grainy black videos. If you weren't around when that happened, you've seen the grainy black videos since. And then three days later came back to Earth. It was amazing, it was an unbelievable accomplishment. And they were heroes. But that didn't end the Apollo program because there was an Apollo 12 that did basically the same thing. Sent three men to the moon, two of them walked on it, and they came back three days later. And then an Apollo 13 mission, which was ostensibly to do the same thing. Three men go to the moon, walk on it, come back again. But something happened. During that mission, two days in, the experts on the ground at Mission Control in Houston call up to the space capsule, to the experts in the space capsule, the astronauts, and ask them to perform a couple of simple tasks, routine tasks that needed to be done. They did. One of the tasks was mix the oxygen tanks. And they started to do that, and then a line came back to mission control in Houston that lives in infamy. Houston, we have a problem. There was an explosion on board, threatened the lunar landing, and frankly threatened whether or not these men would ever make it back to Earth safely. 
And you know, it's a common trait for us humans to think we know the answer before we ask a question, especially if we consider ourselves experienced or experts in the subject. For example, if you're a parent of a toddler who's got chocolate smeared all over their face, and you ask, did you get some of that chocolate cake I told you was for after dinner? You probably know the answer. If you show up at 7 o'clock on a Saturday night to one of the busiest restaurants in town, no reservation, and you ask the host, can we get a party of eight seated for dinner like now? You probably know the answer. Or say a family member from Texas is going to visit you in Minnesota in January, and they ask, do you think it'll be cold when I come back? They probably know the answer. But sometimes we ask questions and don't get the answers we thought we would. You've been through three interviews. You've met several of the employees of the company, and then you receive a phone call from the hiring manager. You say, I am so excited to start working for your company. When do I start? And the voice on the other end says, I'm sorry, but we're going to go in a different direction. You save for months to buy a ring, carefully plan the location to pop the question, rehearse for days exactly what you're going to say, but before you can get the words out, she lets you know she doesn't see a future with you. You've tried for years to get pregnant, test after pregnancy test, all coming up negative. Finally, a positive test. Excitement builds as you make plans over the next couple of months for an addition to the family. But at your next checkup, the doctor's taking much more time to study the ultrasound than normal, looking, listening. You say, everything okay, doc? She says, I'm sorry. Your baby's gone. Unexpected, in some cases, devastating answers to questions we thought we knew the answer to. Well, we meet a man in Luke chapter 10 who's asking questions of Jesus, questions he thought he knew the answer to. After all, he was a learned man, a lawyer, now, not in the sense that we think of lawyers, but a Jewish religious expert in the law. And what follows is a series of questions, both from this lawyer to Jesus and from Jesus to this lawyer, and then answers to those questions from both, and then a parable that, from Jesus that I believe is widely misunderstood or at the very least misapplied. So let's set the scene. Studying the parables, or any scripture for that matter, is very important to understand the context in which the parable is given. If we want to determine the meaning of a parable, we need to understand where, when, why, and to whom Jesus is speaking. Chapter 10 of Luke's gospel begins with Jesus sending out 72 disciples, two by two, into towns in the countryside, and they are to go into those towns, and among other things, Jesus says, tell the people in the towns the kingdom of God has come near to you. And if they entered a town that wasn't willing to listen to what they had to say, then Jesus said, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. Well, some days later, still in chapter 10, the 72 return, and they're thrilled at what they saw, what they heard, what they were able to do, all in Jesus' name because of the authority Jesus had given them. And Jesus says a couple of very interesting things to these disciples. First, in a prayer to his Father, he says, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, I thank you that you've hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. Well, the wise and understanding here that Jesus is speaking of, I think, is a little bit of tongue-in-cheek because it's referring to the self-righteous religious leaders of the day, like the lawyer that's asking him questions. The little children would refer to the simple disciples following, listening to, and learning from Jesus, those that perhaps recognized their need of a Savior. And then Jesus goes on in verse 23. Luke says he turns to the disciples privately and says, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see, for I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see and didn't see it, and to hear what you hear and didn't hear it. Now, presumably at this point, there's several around Jesus listening to him because Luke introduces us in the very next verse to this lawyer who asks the first question in our subject text and my first main point. Because it's a question that every single one of us should ask. Verse 25, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? This is a question every one of us at some point in our lives should ask. 
because the reality of every person ever born is that they will live forever. We're all born with a soul, an eternal soul. The issue is where that soul will spend eternity. And there's only two options given in the Bible, heaven or hell. And it's not that one is great and the other is eh, not quite so great. It's that one is eternal life in immeasurable glory in the very presence of our God. As the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, what no eye has seen nor ear heard nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. The other is eternity separated from God, separated from any fellowship with others, but very fully aware of our circumstances. As Jesus himself stated when he spoke of hell, which he did many times in Matthew's gospel, he said, so it will be at the end of the age, the angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. No, the question all of us need to ask is the same question this lawyer asks. Teacher, Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? But the lawyer wasn't asking this out of a genuine desire to learn some eternal truth from Jesus. How do I know? Because Luke tells us, Look again at the beginning of verse 25. Behold, a lawyer stood up to do what? To put him to the test. He's putting Jesus to the test. And by this point in Jesus' earthly ministry, this was a pretty common occurrence. Religious leaders of all kinds, scribes, Pharisees, Sadducees, and apparently religious lawyers, whose power and influence over the Jewish people was being threatened by this son of a carpenter, we're looking for opportunities to catch Jesus in a controversy, to be able to accuse him of transgressing the law and ultimately to eliminate him. Kind of an ancient Near Eastern version of gotcha journalism, but with deadly consequences. Besides, this religious lawyer knew the answer to his question before he even asked, right? I mean, he's a lawyer, an expert in religious law. He knew what the answer was. Well, maybe not so fast. Because Jesus answers the man's question with a question, which is something personally I find a little bit annoying. You know, honey, have you seen my keys? Well, where'd you put them when you came home? I'm like, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> and I would guess that the lawyers didn't expect the answer either that he got, Jesus answering his question with a question. He asked Jesus, what does he need to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus answers the lawyer by saying in verse 26, what's written in the law? How do you read it? Now, why? Why would Jesus do this? Why answer the question with a question? Well, first, we know because Luke tells us that the man was testing Jesus. We also know from several other scriptures that Jesus understood the motivation of people's hearts. He knew where this guy was coming from. And then third, it was probably very likely obvious that this guy was some type of a Jewish religious leader because they dressed differently. They stood out. They would wear clothes that made it very, very apparent to others who they were and what their status was. Kind of like a modern-day priest who'd wear a collar in public. They stand out. So Jesus, clearly understanding who this man is, as well as his motivation, says, well, you're the lawyer. What's the law say? You tell me. How do you inherit eternal life? And I can kind of imagine the lawyer kind of straightening his collar and tugging on his tunic a little bit, quite sure of himself. When he answers Jesus by confidently reciting scripture, verse 27. And he, the lawyer, answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And as this lawyer kind of stands there smugly, proud of himself, confident in self-righteousness, thinking he's really backing Jesus into a corner, Jesus simply says, You've answered correctly. Do this, and you'll live. Now, before going any further, the lawyer's answer is scripturally accurate. You'd expect as much from a lawyer, a professor of sorts, an expert in religious law. He'd know his scripture. He was actually combining two Old Testament texts that were very familiar, not just to religious leaders, but to your common Jew on the street. They knew this. First was Deuteronomy 6, verse 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And the second was from Leviticus chapter 19, at least the last half of this verse, which starts, you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as 
yourself. This was very common knowledge among Jews. And in fact, Jesus said the same thing in Matthew's gospel, another incidence of where religious leaders are testing Jesus and they confront him and say, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus says in Matthew 22, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments, Jesus said, depend the whole law and the prophets. In fact, the first half of the Ten Commandments deal with loving God. The second half deal with loving others. So the lawyer's answer here is correct. It's scripturally accurate in that it's the summation of the entire law. Love God, love others, but do it perfectly, always. Your entire being devoted to the singular purpose of loving God and loving others and thereby glorifying God. So Jesus' response to this lawyer's statement in verse 28 is a a little befuddling at first glance. Jesus said, you've answered correctly. Do this and you'll live. It's kind of like if you're in the crowd at this point, it's like, hey, Jesus, come on. This guy's confronting you. Don't you want to tell him, like, no, believe in me. Believe in me and you'll live. I mean, come on, Jesus, where's the beef? Where's the gospel? But Jesus understands something, something we do well to understand, too, that there's a whole other issue going on here. It's how this man views himself. And it's key to understanding the parable that Jesus is about to tell. Remember again how Luke 10 begins. 72 disciples sent out by Jesus two by two. They go into all the towns in the countryside, and among other things, they're supposed to tell the people in the towns the kingdom of God is near. Well, if I'm a person in one of those towns, I'm probably going to ask a logical question. These guys are coming in saying, repent, the kingdom of God is here. Repent, the kingdom of God is here. Where? Where's the kingdom of God? And the answer is, wherever the king is. The kingdom is is wherever the king is. If King Charles is in Buckingham Palace, the British royal standard, the flag of the monarchy, flies above the palace. If he leaves and goes to his country estate, that flag goes with him. Wherever he goes, that goes. The kingdom is wherever the king is. Well, next in chapter 10, if you remember the 72 return, they're amazed at what they saw, what they heard, what they accomplished in Jesus' name. And Jesus then says, as he's praying to his father, thank you, father, you've hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Another question, who are the wise and understanding? We talked about this earlier. There are those like this religious lawyer who can easily recite scripture, but they don't know what they're saying. The other question is, who are the little children? And the answer would be those like the 72 disciples who recognize their need of a savior. They have a childlike faith. Then Jesus says to the disciples, they're blessed because they've seen and heard things that prophets and kings long to see. And the reality is, if this learned lawyer who could easily recite scripture would see this and hear the same things that the disciples were seeing and hearing, maybe he'd understand the kingdom of God is near and it's standing right in front of him. So instead, what's the question the lawyer asks? What's he say to Jesus? Verse 25 again. Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? See, this man doesn't understand his need of a savior. He doesn't need the gospel, the good news, because he doesn't know what the bad news is. He has no understanding of his condition. He's on the same treadmill so many of us find ourselves on or have found ourselves on. What do I need to do? How long do I need to pray each day? How much do I need to give to church? How many things do I need to volunteer for? Please, please, Jesus, tell me, what do I need to do, 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 do? And we never know when it's enough because it never will be enough. The right question, the right question all of us need to ask is the question the lawyer asked. What do I need to do to inherit eternal life? But the right answer It's already been done for you. Now, verse 29 of Luke 10 makes it clear that this lawyer doesn't understand his condition, that he thinks he's got this eternal life thing in the bag when Luke writes, but he, the lawyer, desiring to justify himself, says to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? 
Well, let's leave aside the fact that apparently this guy believes he's got the first part of the eternal life equation down. You know, the whole love of the Lord your God with your whole heart, your whole uh, soul, your whole strength, and your whole mind. It's like, really, Mr. Lawyer, really? You're telling me that you love the Lord your God perfectly all the time with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, never a stray action, never a stray thought, never a stray deed, never a stray word. In your mind, you could just stroll into eternal life right now, not even any self-righteousness or pride. The lawyer wants, to, wants Jesus to tell him, who's my neighbor? He doesn't need any instruction on how to love the Lord, at least not in his mind. He's got that part down. Perhaps this Jesus character has some different ideas about who my neighbor is. So Jesus, our Lord, is about to engage in some personal evangelism. Now, Jesus could have just turned around, left this guy standing there, recognizing he was yet another self-righteous religious leader of the day. Instead, he tells the lawyer a story, a story that's designed to crush his self-righteous attitude, that he, like all of us, is eternally doomed apart from the salvation offered by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. The purpose of the parable of the Good Samaritan is to point to our need for salvation, not to justify more good works. Let me say that again. The purpose of the parable of the Good Samaritan is to point to our need for salvation, not to justify more good works. Again, Jesus is telling a story to crush this man's self-righteousness, to shatter his pride, convict him of the reality of his doomed condition. This lawyer has no sense of being lost apart from Christ, which is the bad news. And if you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus as Savior, you're no different. You need to know the bad news before you can appreciate the good news. And here, I believe, is where many go wrong with the meaning of the parable of the Good Samaritan. Because on the surface, this appears to be a nice story about kindness and helping others, those in, in need, less fortunate than ourselves. I mean, it's a story that you all, you know, it's been used to justify social justice initiatives both inside and outside churches for decades, for centuries. It's also been used to make us all feel a bit guilty for not giving more to various causes. Or if someone recounts a story, for example, of them being stranded on the side of a road on a cold wintry night, and then some stranger stops to help them, what do they usually say? A good Samaritan stopped to help. Entire ministries have been started using the Samaritan name, one that this church participates in as we approach Christmas, Samaritan's Purse. Wonderful ministry. Look, giving to the poor, the less fortunate, providing meals, clothing, shelter, money for others, helping those who can't help themselves are all worthy God-honoring practices that should be encouraged by this church and all churches. It should be a natural outgrowth of and evidence of our love of others because of the love we've been shown in Christ. But it's not the point of this parable. So let's take a look at the story Jesus is about to tell. Verse 30. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him, beat him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Understand the audience. Jesus is responding to the lawyer's question, who's my neighbor? But he's speaking within the hearing of at least the 72 disciples and probably many others, and he's telling a story using familiar landmarks, practices, and occupations to all of those that were listening. Everybody hearing him would have understood and recognized what he was doing, what he was saying. They would have been able to catch the reference. For example, the road from Jerusalem down to Jericho still exists, but it was a common one in those days. It's about 15 miles. It's a very windy road. Jerusalem sits about 3,000 feet above sea level. Jericho, about 1,000 feet below sea level. And this was a road that was considered dangerous. It wound through canyons and rocky crags and lots of places for ne'er-do-wells to hide and cause trouble. And people knew this is not a place that you should walk alone. In fact, in the Old Testament, the book of Joshua, part of this road from Jerusalem to Jericho was known as the Pass of Adumum. And Adumum's a loose form of the Hebrew word for blood. So literally, by some, it was known as Blood Pass. And it's certainly for some dramatic effect that Jesus says, a man was going down this road alone. If you're sitting in that audience, you're one of the listeners, you're thinking, whoa, this isn't going to end well. 
and it doesn't. The man gets jumped, robbed of his belongings, and left for dead. Verse 31. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, passed by on the other side. Again, all the listeners, including the religious lawyer, could imagine a priest of the day, a Jewish priest. Surely they probably thought the Jewish priest will stop to help the man, but he doesn't. The priest acts like Dion Warwick and kind of walks on by, or maybe smash mouth, you know, he might as well be walking on the sun, he's in a hurry. Verse 32, so likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side. A Levite, a caretaker of the temple, a keeper of the law, surely this guy's going to stop, right, Jesus? Nope. Pulls a Sergeant Schultz and sees nothing. And then the story gets outrageous. Jesus continues. A Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. A Samaritan? A Samaritan? Seriously, Jesus? A Samaritan? Samaritans were not well thought of by Jews, and they were most definitely not considered neighbors. In fact, many Jews hated Samaritans and thought of them as half-breeds, traitors, going back to the time of King Jeroboam several hundred years earlier. They were considered evil because they intermarried with Gentiles, and they also tried to stop the rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem and temple after the Jews came back from their captivity in Babylon. In fact, if you wanted to say something really bad about somebody in Jesus' day, you wanted to call them a bad name, you'd probably call them a Samaritan, which is exactly what some of the Jewish leaders did in John's gospel when they confronted Jesus at one point. They said, are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan? and have a demon? They're basically calling Jesus a demon-possessed outcast who had no part in God's kingdom, which is what they believed about Samaritans. They had no part in God's kingdom. They certainly were not the Jews' neighbor. So for Jesus to turn this story on its head and say that a Samaritan stopped to help this beaten man was shocking. A shocking, unexpected turn to this made-up story, one that shows this lawyer and us just how radical and lavish our love is to be to our neighbor if we're counting on ourselves and our actions to earn our passage into eternal life. Now, since the time Jesus first told this parable up till modern day, there's been no shortage of theories about who's who in this parable, what was going through the minds of the various characters in the story. You've probably heard or read or believed some of them. For example, I've heard where some people think the priest didn't help the beaten man because he didn't want to defile himself before serving in the temple, or the Levite didn't want to help the beaten man because Jewish law didn't allow for him to touch a dead body. So he's walking on the other side of the road, and he sees the guy over there, he's not moving, maybe he's dead, I better just keep going. There are even some commentators who go into great detail about uh, what the Samaritan's animal represents, what the inn represents, what the innkeeper was thinking, etc., etc., etc. Some of this is harmless, some isn't helpful at all. The truth is that we have no idea what was in the head of the priest, the Levite, the Samaritan, the innkeeper, the beaten man because they don't exist. This is a story. Jesus is telling a story to illustrate a point, a point that this Jewish lawyer, expert in the law that he was, needed to see the bankruptcy of his self-righteousness and his inability to keep the real meaning of loving God and loving neighbor perfectly, all the time, with his entire being. And by the way, the whole loving your neighbor as ourselves doesn't mean we need to learn to love ourselves before we can love others. That's not what Jesus is teaching. Loving our neighbors as ourselves means loving others as much or more than we love ourselves. It's about sacrificial love. It's about thinking of others before we think of ourselves. And our neighbor isn't always who we think it is. It may not be the kindly old man who lives next door that occasionally helps us some yard work. Your neighbor might very well be someone who looks nothing like you, who spouts beliefs contrary to yours, 
who belongs to political parties or social groups you'd never consider, or maybe cheers loudly for some team you'd never cheer for. <laughs> How'd that get up there? Yet in spite of this, Jesus is showing the radical, lavish, endless love that we're called to show to our neighbor. The reality, actually, is that this Jewish lawyer and any of us can find ourselves in any one of these roles. For example, the priest. If you're relying on religion to save you, if you think church attendance and adherence to religious rules will save you, you're sadly mistaken. Or how about the Levite, relying on proper behavior to save? If you think you're doing all the right moral stuff, that you're a good person, certainly not like a Samaritan, and that's going to gain you entrance into eternal life, you're headed for a tragic reality. Or the beaten man, who was oblivious to his surroundings before he got jumped, we had all best realized that we are indeed the beaten man. We're walking down a dangerous road, ostensibly fully clothed and with all of our belongings, but there's real forces of evil waiting to rob us. There's influences from others looking to beat us and our own sins that leave us bleeding and dying on the side of the road. This parable, the parable of the Good Samaritan, is a call to action. But it's not one to dig deeper into your pocket and give to another worthy cause. It's a call to recognize the hopeless state that we're all in, just like the lawyer. That there's no way to fulfill the command to love the Lord your God with all your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. You can't do it. Nobody can. There's only one who can truly fill the role of good Samaritan. And there's many ways that the Samaritan in this story is like Jesus. Radical, shocking, lavish love offered to a complete stranger. For example, the Samaritan was an outsider, despised by many. How does Isaiah say it? Despised by many. Jesus was rejected by his own people. Jesus knew what it was like to be treated as a Samaritan. The Samaritan came after others failed to meet the need. How many of the kings and priests and teachers of the Jews had led their people to stray over the centuries? And how many still do the same today, both inside of churches and outside of churches, leading to false gods or self-righteousness of religion, of looking to things of this world for salvation? The Samaritan came before it was too late. Regardless of where you're at tonight or if you're watching online, it's not too late. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what baggage you've brought in here. I don't care who you've hurt, how you've lived your life up to this moment. Don't believe the lie that you're not good enough. Because nobody is good enough. Jesus will meet you right where you are. It's not too late to come to Jesus. The Samaritan came with everything necessary. The Samaritan in the parable comes with oil and wine to soothe the beaten man's wounds, bandages to stop the bleeding, an animal to carry him safely to the inn, and seemingly endless resources to bring him back to health. Jesus came to earth and took on flesh, perfectly God, perfectly man, lived a sinless life, shed his blood on the cross for our sins. For our sake, he made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. The Samaritan came right to the afflicted man. Look, you may not recognize it, but all of us, all of us are stripped, beaten, bleeding, and left for dead apart from Christ. And there's no religion, there's no rules, there are no, there's no moral deeds that will bring you safely to eternal life. But again, Jesus can meet you right where you are. He knows what you need before you ask your compassionate Savior is standing over you, beaten man. Open the eyes of your heart and see the free gift of salvation that he's offering. The Samaritan gave tender care. Unlike religion, unlike worldly pursuits, unlike our own efforts to be good enough to earn eternal life, Jesus says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. If you're weighed down by your labors, feeling inadequate, questioning if there's anything or anyone who can relieve the burden of earning your own way to heaven, 
Come to the one who offers forgiveness and mercy. Not what we deserve, but forgiveness and mercy, giving it by grace to those who trust in him. And finally, the Samaritan provided for future needs. In the parable, the Samaritan pulls out two denarii for the innkeeper. Non-biblical historians have indicated that a one-night stay in an inn at that time would have cost roughly one thirty-second of a denarii. So do the math. He gave him enough money to keep the guy in the inn for two months. But he didn't stop there. He said, hey, whatever else the guy needs, take care of him and I'll repay you when I come back. A seemingly endless well of resources to the stranger, the beaten man. Well, Jesus' sacrifice provides forgiveness of sins, past, present, and future, for those who believe in him as Lord and Savior. A truly endless well of forgiveness and grace. Our good Samaritan, our good shepherd, our mighty Savior lives. And only he can bandage the wounds our sins have created. Only he can provide all that is needed now and for eternity. Only he can provide the radical, lavish, sacrificial, and perfect love demanded for entrance into eternal life. And the good news is that we don't need to do anything other than accept by faith what's been done on our behalf. The free gift of immeasurable grace offered to us through Jesus' death and resurrection. Those Apollo 13 astronauts, I'm sure most of you have seen the Tom Hanks movie, did make it home safely. That movie is relatively true. Uh, but they didn't do it alone. In spite of the experts' questions and requests and surprised answers, uh, they did make it home safely, but they had a lot of help. And I have no idea what happened to this Jewish lawyer. Luke doesn't tell us. Similar to the rich young ruler in Matthew's gospel who asked a very similar question. We don't know what happened to these men. I pray that they uh, discovered that for their sake, that they recognized that their striving to earn their own salvation was fruitless and that they put their trust in Christ. But I also pray for all of us that we don't walk away from this parable, this very familiar parable of the Good Samaritan, thinking about what more we need to do to inherit eternal life, that we would recognize that Jesus paid it all on the cross. It's done. Pray with me. Lord, thank you for these words, these very familiar words. Lord, again, I pray that we have a little bit deeper understanding of what you were teaching your parables were not without purpose. They were kingdom-minded. They were reminding us what the kingdom is like, and they're reminding us what you have done for us and the futility of our own striving to earn our way to heaven. I pray, Father, for anyone here who doesn't know you as Savior, that they today, tonight, right now, realize that you can meet them right where they are, Tonight, they can have forgiveness and freedom from striving for perfection. And salvation is within their hands if they would just accept by faith the grace, the gift that you're offering. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.